Why don't we get to a uh, conclusion here. Um, I am, once again, Brooks Klimley, and I'm very happy to uh, be introducing David Sandelow, who's the Under Secretary of Energy and Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs in the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy. Uh, under, as Under Secretary of Energy, David has oversees the Department's renewable energy, energy efficiency, and fossil energy, nuclear energy, and electricity delivery programs. And as Secretary for Policy and International Affairs, he helps coordinate policy and manage international activities at the department. Uh, prior to being confirmed as Assistant Secretary, uh, David was an uh, environmental, uh, energy and environmental scholar and senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at the Brookings Institute, as well as Energy and Climate Change Working Group Chair at the Clinton uh, Global Initiative. Uh, he's very well published in uh, periodicals, magazines, and uh, was a graduate of Michigan Law School and Yale College. So David, welcome. And for our final uh, presentation. Good luck. Thank, you so much. Thank you very much, Brooks. It's great to be here. It looks like a great agenda. Congratulations to everybody who pulled together this conference. Um, and you know, what I, what I work on these days is the kind of transformational changes in the global energy landscape, and it's remarkable how much of that is happening. And, so it's hard to think of a more interesting uh, time to generate independent, rigorous, analytic thinking on this topic. And so I was particularly delighted uh, in preparing for this to learn about the investment that Columbia University is making in this area. Um, I was also delighted to learn that Columbia has hired my former Brookings colleague and current administration colleague, Jason Bordoff, who is really a, a leader in this area. So uh, congratulations to Columbia for a great hire with, with Jason, and, and congratulations to Jason on this position. I think it's a very exciting time on this, in this area, and, I, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk today about Hurricane Sandy um, and its impact on the energy infrastructure. Because um, one month ago last night, Hurricane Sandy slammed into the east coast of the United States. Um, the storm made landfall just south of Atlantic City, New Jersey, with 80 mile power winds, torrential rains, and record storm surges. Uh, I'm sure many of you experienced it directly. In Manhattan's Battery Park, the oceans rose nine feet higher than a typical high tide and three feet higher than the previous record. Sandy's 1,100-mile diameter made it the largest Atlantic hurricane on record. The results were devastating. Uh, tragically, more than 100 lives were lost in the storm. And our thoughts and prayers go out to the families who lost loved ones and are still displaced by the storm and still living through its terrible aftermath. Today, suffering from Sandy continues and many thousands of people are just beginning the arduous journey of rebuilding their homes and, and lives, and many communities have been altered forever. Um, and the road to recovery is going to be long, and the admin Obama administration is committed to standing with you. Um, but since this is an energy symposium, I thought it might be appropriate to say a few words about Sandy's impact on the energy infrastructure, which was so significant. Um, about the federal response and some preliminary thoughts about lessons learned just one month after the storm hit. That's what I'll talk about today. Um, so Sandy's impact on the energy infrastructure, as I said, was especially devastating. High winds took down power lines, rising seas flooded electric substations. Within 24 hours of Sandy's landfall, more than 8.5 million utility customers had lost power. Fuel distribution networks were paralyzed. Critical terminals for petroleum and petroleum products were badly damaged. Many service stations lost power and couldn't pump gas, and leading to long gasoline lines in the New York, New Jersey area. Now, in terms of the response, state and local governments are the front lines of, of any disaster response. State and local governments respond to thousands of incidents each year without federal involvement. However, for major disasters, state and local governments typically seek federal assistance. There's legislation called the Stafford Act, which dates to 1988 in its current form, and gives the federal government authority to respond to major disasters and identifies conditions under which assistance can be provided. Now, as Hurricane Sandy approached, the Federal Energy Management Agency, FEMA, moved to activate other federal agencies 
that would be needed for preparations in the days leading up to the storm. This included the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Health and Human Services. Teams from these agencies and others worked throughout the weekend to coordinate logistics in the weekend before Sandy hit. And because of this, 12 hours before the storm hit on a Monday night, combined emergency response teams from all these agencies were at the ready. At DOE, our fuel and electricity experts were disseminating data to states about what critical energy facilities and infrastructure would need to be protected and what the likely requirements would be in communities along the storm's path. On the morning of October 30th, President Obama sent his leadership team a clear message to cut through the bureaucracy, eliminate any red tape, and mobilize immediately for rapid response. And while the federal response was broad-based, our work is not done. We made important contributions that helped people get their power back faster, get businesses and hospitals up and running, but our work and our assessment is ongoing. I'd like to take a moment to thank in particular the thousands of workers who came from around the country to help get the power back on. Local utilities organized mutual assistance groups, a tool that's used by utility industry in response to storms. They moved emergency workers and equipment into position. Altogether, more than 70,000 linemen, technicians, and other workers arriving from around the nation helped with power restoration. And in the days leading up to and just after the storm, the federal government and utilities were talking with each other regularly at, at all levels. One immediate result of this collaboration between utilities and the federal government was that the White House declared utility workers as first responders. That allowed utility trucks priority access to emergency fuel supplies and other resources. In addition, President Obama approved a 100% cost share under the Stafford Act to conduct emergency power restoration. Uh, that accelerated collaboration between federal, state, and local bureaucracies. That was just a word about electricity, and by the way, in the first three days after the storm hit, power was restored um, to roughly four million customers, with a million the day after that and a million the day after that. But the storm was huge, and obviously major electricity outages lingered for many, many days after the storm. Uh, now, Hur Hurricane Sandy also caused significant damage to the fuel distribution infrastructure. And here again, the federal government moved quickly uh, to help where it could. The Coast Guard helped to get ports open. Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano issued a temporary blanket waiver of a statute known as the Jones Act, which provided for immediately, which immediately allowed additional fuel tankers from the Gulf of Mexico to provide additional fuel resources to the region. The Environmental Protection Agency temporarily waived federal clean gasoline requirements for gasoline in 16 states to remove potential barriers to the supply of gasoline into the region. And the administration proactively reached out to industry to ensure that generators were delivered to service stations that lacked electrical power to increase overall fuel availability. For the first time in, human, in, first time in history, the president directed the Energy Department to loan the Department of Defense diesel from the Northeast uh, Heating Oil Reserve in, to help get fuel out into the market. Now, our energy infrastructure, as people here know and are expert in, our energy infrastructure is a complex network of interrelated systems that function across jurisdictions and across industries. To function effectively, responders were required to operate as a complex network, bringing together government officials, the private sector, community groups, and others. Working closely with the state and local officials, the federal government undertook efforts to get the region's fuel system back up and running. So while many of the energy issues related to Hurricane Sandy are behind us, this response, the response to the tragedy is ongoing, as I've said. But it's never too soon to take stock and to begin to think about some initial lessons that we've learned from Sandy, especially while memories are, are still fresh. So let me offer several, uh, several lessons. So, so first is an obvious point. Modern society depends on energy surfaces. We all know this, but especially here at an energy symposium, it's maybe worth highlighting. 
Without electricity, homes and businesses are dark. Beyond that, elevators stop. Many grocers can't sell food. Traffic lights don't work. Hospitals can't treat patients. Refineries can't operate. Pipelines can't move product. And service stations can't sell gasoline. And then without a steady supply of petroleum, today's transportation system cannot function. So a second lesson from Sandy, in addition, citizens with cell phones are powerful sources of information in a disaster. Today, there are over 330 million mobile subscribers in the United States, more than one device per person on average. The best-selling camera in the world is a Nokia cell phone. Combined with social media like Twitter, Facebook, and GasBuddy, mobile devices empower citizens to quickly and accurately report problems. Smartphones and social media tools can improve situational awareness in a disaster and dramatically improve response planning. They can also keep those affected by a disaster engaged and informed. So, Coming out of this experience, we believe governments, utilities, and others can do more to capture the potential of mobile devices to speed response to recovery. A third lesson, in flood zones, critical electrical equipment such as breaker boxes and building connections should not be in basements or on ground floors. This point may seem obvious, but this basic vulnerability is found in many thousands of buildings in low-lying areas throughout our country and throughout the world. Building codes in general do not address this. And in the days and weeks following Hurricane Sandy, water damage to critical electrical equipment dramatically slowed electric restoration in many locations. Uh, so a fourth lesson, with regards to fuel distribution, the Northeast might look to the Gulf Coast for some lessons. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, refineries and other pieces of fuel infrastructure were hardened. Some power lines were put underground, backup generators were positioned, and in some places, fuel infrastructure was elevated or barriers erected. Several years later, when Hurricane Ike approached, fuel storage tanks and pumping trucks were pre-positioned in key locations. Priority was given to restoring power to fuel infrastructure, among other steps. More analysis will be needed to determine exactly what infrastructure hardening is most effective in the Northeast, but this is work that we should do quickly. A fifth lesson, we ignore the climate threat at our peril. While we can't attribute any particular weather event to climate change, we do know the temperature around the globe is increasing faster than was predicted even 10 years ago. We know the Arctic ice cap is melting faster than was predicted even five years ago. We know there have been more severe weather events here in North America and around the globe. And by one calculation, every incremental inch of storm surge in New York City displaced an additional 6,000 people. The sea level has already risen seven inches in the last 100 years, and is projected to rise more than 30 inches in the next 100. President Obama is a firm believer that climate change is real, that it's impacted by human behavior and carbon emissions, and that we have an obligation to do something about it. To meet the threat of climate change, we must plan wisely, improve our infrastructure, and cut emissions of heat-trapping gases. The transition to a clean energy economy can help mitigate risks from extreme weather events and is a powerful driver of economic progress. And finally, Hurricane Sandy was yet another reminder that disaster response is a complex undertaking. It requires sustained partnerships engaging federal, state, and local agencies, the private sector and civil society, academia, community clubs, and religious groups. Our work together must begin long before disaster strikes. There is always room for improvement, and Sandy has illustrated ways our energy systems are still vulnerable to disruption. We, must see, that, we see that at every stage of disaster response, leadership matters, planning matters, community matters, as we care for those still suffering from Sandy's wrath, let us pledge to learn more from the past and improve our ability to respond in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Congratulations on this excellent conference. All the best for the days ahead. And yeah, delighted to take a few questions if people have them. Hi, I'm Michael Didick. I'm a um, 
uh, SEPA first year student. Uh, last month I was at the Harvard, Harvard Energy Symposium and the, a keynote from, uh, from Boston Consulting Group. He spoke about how the lack of investment in new capacity in energy, in energy will result in a major power shortfall in the coming years. And then uh, today in the finance panel it was unanimous that we heard about uh, the biggest concern um, for them was, uh, was government policy or lack thereof uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, their ability to uh, to justify uh, finance, even though funding is available. So I'm just wondering how the government's addressing this, and uh, and uh, what their view is on on an impending uh, uh, crisis in in energy if if this isn't addressed properly. Thanks for the question. It's one that's important globally. I, I think it's useful to broaden the frame of, of the question because um, around the world, energy needs are growing and growing dramatically. They're growing especially quickly in developing countries. We just heard a interest, tremendous discussion of this from the China panel. Um, and, and the energy landscape is shifting as well. Um, in, in the United States, the most dramatic shift in energy in the past several years has been the growth in, in shale gas um, and the use of shale gas. Um, it, just a couple of years ago, strikingly, coal provided 50% of our electricity generation in the United States and natural gas provided about 20%. For the first time a couple of months ago, earlier this year, there was a shift, and natural gas actually provided more dispatch of electricity than coal did in one month. 33% natural gas and 32% coal, so really a, a dramatic shift. Um, and in the face of shifts like that, um, it is important, as your question suggests, and, uh, to make sure that we're maintaining ad adequate generation capacity. And we have organizations um, in the United States um, that planning organizations, often multi-state planning organizations, that are focused on that at the Office of uh, Electricity Delivery in the Department of Energy. We have some responsibilities in that area and as well are constantly looking at, at adequacy of generation capacity. So it's, it's something that, that um, is handled at multiple different levels in the United States um, with the Department of Energy where I work having some s significant responsibilities in this regard. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Undersecretary, for your speech. Um, I'm Florian Reber. I'm also from uh, SIPA. Um, as you spoke about sign, uh, Sandy and climate change, um, these days um, governments are meeting in Doha for COP18. Um, and I was wondering whether you could um, give us your thoughts on what, are, what, are your, um, uh, what you expect about outcomes in Doha. It, may, it might not be kind of the big positive outcomes, but are there like signs for more positive incremental change um, at maybe yeah, positive change, what can happen there? Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm not, I, I'm not personally involved in those negotiations, so I don't want to comment on the prospects specifically in those negotiations. But, but I do want to underscore two points about climate change. First, as I said in my remarks, this is something that President Obama believes is real. It's a threat that we need to address. Um, and, and, and second, um, this is a, a threat that we can address while growing our economy. And, and at the U.S. Department of Energy, we've been particularly focused on energy innovation. Um, that's why I didn't say a word about that, because my boss is Energy Secretary Stephen Chu. Um, and you know, people here probably know he's the winner of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics and, and has, has brought to the Department of Energy a laser-like focus on using science and technology for energy innovation. Um, and it's amazing what's happened just in the past several years on this front. I mean, for example, the cost of solar panels um, have dropped 75% over the course of, of four years. Um, and, and we've seen significant increases in, um, or sort of decreases in the cost of batteries, for example. Um, uh, and, and what we're focusing on at the Department of Energy as a priority is trying to accelerate that pace. Um, I know some other questions, but let me just elaborate on this for a minute because we have some new and powerful tools in this regard that, you know, if, if, if I were in graduate school right now, I would be very excited about working on. Um, uh, one of them, which I, I think has got all kinds of potential, is the use of high-performance high computers in, uh, in this field. Um, 
today, high performance computers have the power of a, of a million laptops. Um, and the computing power that we have at our beck and call now and that we anticipate to have in the years ahead offers new opportunities for accelerating innovation and technology development that were not there in the past. Um, uh, just two quick examples on this. Um, high performance computers were used for in, in aerodynamic modeling to come up with a really cheap add-on device that you can put under a diesel truck um, that reduces dra aerodynamic drag and improves fuel efficiency. And we've been using high performance computers for modeling in wind farms to understand the optimal placement of wind turbines um, to, in terms of the aerodynamic drag from one turbine to the next. So, which is it's a lot easier to use a computer when you're doing a wind farm because it's really hard to move a wind turbine from one place to another place. Um, so th there are just tremendous opportunities um, to apply new high technology tools to energy technology development. A lot of interesting work in that regard. Um, Sir. Hi, uh, Rob Lifflander, and I'm involved with um, some distributed solar companies. I'm just wondering um, what you think the government's, the federal government's role should be in investing in basic uh, research uh, for some of the um, key uh, scientific areas and, and technology that um, are going to be necessary, whether it's material science or uh, energy storage, et cetera. Thank you for the question, and it, it's, a, it's a very important one, and, and my answer is the federal government has a key and important role in basic science research. Um, and I guess two comments about this. First, you know, in Washington today there's a lot of political arguments about lots and lots of topics. Um, I th this is an area that I, I think it's safe to say has as much consensus as any that are out there. I mean, you really hear on all sides of the political spectrum people saying government should be investing in basic research. There's, don't, don't get me wrong, there's disagreements. There's disagreements about the extent of the funding and that type of thing, but I think, I, I think there is um, a lot of agreement on that basic proposition, and it's a good thing. And, and let me just give two examples, a couple of examples. I mean, first, I mentioned shale gas earlier, and shale gas is revolutionizing American energy right now. Uh, if I may make a parochial comment, the, the initial research done on shale gas technologies on hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling was done at the U.S. Department of Energy about 30 years ago, or, or the, some of the initial research that led to the commercialization, I, could, I should say, um, more precisely. Um, and, and federal government research was instrumental in uh, the creation of the internet, famously, out of DARPA, in the Google search engine. So federal government research is, is really important in this area. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, we have a question. Uh, time for one more question. Just okay. Yeah. Um, I actually didn't have power for 16 days after Hurricane Katrina, and the major reason for that was that the uh, Long Island Power Authority actually turned away repair teams from other states because apparently they didn't belong to the public union of LIPA and therefore they wouldn't let them work on Long Island even though there are millions of people whose lives were endangered because we have no electricity in 35 degree weather for such a long time. Mm. And I just wondered what the Obama administration could do to prevent this in the future where some of these organizations really have a stranglehold on emergency activities. Let me say this. One of the reasons I wanted to give this speech was to get feedback like this and to find out what we need to work on in the future. I don't have a specific answer to your question, but I would like to follow up um, and learn more about the situation that you encountered um, and whether there's a federal role. I mean, and, and as I said, state and local governments are in the front lines here, but the federal government plays an important role here. And um, uh, I emphasize in my remarks, and we're keenly aware that the suffering continues, and a lot of people are still struggling to, to, to make their way back. Uh, and while memories are fresh, while you know you're you're still just a little ways out of that terrible experience, we'd like to talk with you. So actually, maybe like stick around for a minute right after the remarks, find out a little bit more about this, um, and uh, and follow up, um, and, and and but more broadly beyond your particular instance, figure out what what lessons learned, what we can do to facilitate the response in the future. Uh, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time and attention, and best wishes to Columbia for this great effort. Thank you.